Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Matt Abbott, and I'm the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs here at the Council. Before we begin, please note, today's event is on the record and is being live streamed. We always welcome social media engagement, but please silence your phones. We are grateful for the support of our members in attendance tonight. If you have any questions about membership, please visit one of our young professional ambassadors on the side of the room after the program. The Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. I would like to extend a special thank you to German Consul General Herbert Kelle and his fantastic team at the German Consulate in Chicago for making this program possible. Also, the Council is grateful for the support it received as part of the Deutschlandar USA campaign through the German Federal Foreign Office, Goethe Institute, and Federation of German Industries. Turning back to our program, Ambassador Haber will deliver remarks, followed by a moderated conversation with Council President Evo Dalder. After the moderated conversation, we will be taking questions from the room or online. To submit your question, please type open your browser to chi.cnf.io. Now, by way of brief introduction, our speaker this evening is Emily Haber, who has served as German Ambassador to the United States since June 2018. Immediately prior to this appointment, she was deployed to the Federal Ministry of the Interior, serving as State Secretary overseeing security and migration at the height of the refugee crisis in Europe. She is a career Foreign Service officer who has attended schools in New Delhi, Bonn, Paris, Brussels, Washington, and Athens. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Emily Haber. Um, for reasons of historical documentation, I have to correct one thing. The stations he mentioned were not career posts. Actually, I went to school in these uh, countries. But, um, dear Ivo Daldo, where is he sitting? There he is. Uh, dear board members, honorable members of the Chicago Consular Corps, and ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you how delighted I am to be here tonight. I was very much looking forward to, uh, to this for two reasons, one of them professional and the other one for family <laughs> um, history reasons. And to begin with the latter, my paternal grandfather, historian, was a visiting professor at the University of Chicago from 1905 to 1906. At the time, Chicago, as seen from Germany, was a myth of speed and progress and energy. And the new university, barely founded uh, 15 years uh, before, or refounded, I should say, was an intellectual magnet. Last weekend, I read for the first time in my life my grandmother's diaries. I hadn't known them before. My brother was in possession of them. And these are diaries of her two years here in ancient German script, therefore very difficult to decipher. But what she observed during her American years was a society embracing change and embracing progress with a vengeance. And that moved me very much. So it's very special for me to be in Chicago, which I'm sure has lost none of the dynamism um, of more than 100 years ago, and remains the urban and economic and intellectual center of America's heartland, the heart of the heartland, as it were. And in this vein, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs under the leadership of Ivo Dalder, is one of the influential US think tanks that are not situated in eastern or western coastal cities or inside the Beltway, for that matter. And your global leaders, global cities conferences, I know, are inspiring events that attract attendance from many, many countries, including from Germany. I'm not quite sure who suggested the title for today's talk. But on second thoughts, I thought it was aptly ambiguous, as it were. Caught in the middle of what? In the middle of US domestic debates, of disputes between the US and the EU, of disputes within the EU, 
or its own geographic environment, close as we are both to Russia and the Middle East. It's probably all of these. So let me take the bull by the horns. There is a pervasive sense in both the United States and Germany that our bilateral relationship is under stress. It's true that we disagree on a number of issues. We are being challenged on burden sharing, we, Germany, on burden sharing in NATO, and there's a reason for that. We have some disagreement or different angles on Iran, on trade, on sanctions or other policies vis-a-vis -vis Russia, on climate change, and so on. Now, disagreements happen among partners. Some have existed for a long time. And in the case of some, we, Germany, are faced with a solid bipartisan position, which is something we have to take very seriously. But we have to distinguish whether we disagree on ends or we disagree on means. Now, take Iran, for example. We, that is, the United States and Germany, agree that Iranian behavior in the region is destructive. We agree on our strategic objectives, that is, preventing Iran from developing a nuclear bomb, setting strict limits to its missile program, stopping its attempts at uh, destabilizing the region. Where we differ is how to get there via the constraints constraints defined by the JCPOA or by withdrawing from it and exerting indiscriminate maximum pressure wherever possible. Another example is Russia. We agree, both our countries, that Russia has become a revisionist power. We agree that the annexation of the Crimea is illegal. We agree on its war in eastern Ukraine. We agree that all of that, or cyber uh, warfare, is completely unacceptable. But again, we discuss the right mix of tools to be applied in order to change the behavior. Sanctions are necessary. I agree with that. They're the toughest form of diplomatic language. But apart from the disincentives they offer and they apply, we also need incentives to complete our toolbox. So despite our differences or different angles on a variety of issues, I'm confident that we can argue them out among administrations that have, after all, decades-long experiences in doing just this. But there are some larger trends where we still navigate uncharted waters. We are seeing a geopolitical climate change triggered by China's meteoric rise as an economic powerhouse, as a technological superpower, and increasingly as a regional military hegemon. And Russia, over and above its moves in Ukraine and Crimea, is re-emerging as a military power, using asymmetric warfare, including cyber warfare, for its geopolitical ends. And while ISIS has been defeated, or may have been defeated, it has left behind a fractured landscape of jihadism, which is difficult to pinpoint, and may, for that very reason, turn out to be even more dangerous. Another important trend results from the environment in which all of this happens, all of which I had described. Globalization as an upshot of technological progress in mobility and communication, including the known unknown of artificial intelligence. All of this greatly impacts on the international community and the way that nation states interact. It has also reduced the space for sovereign decision making, which in turn has deeply affected domestic politics. And this has triggered, triggered and is compounded by a fundamental change in how the US administration, and some in Europe too, view the global political architecture. In a way, this is perfectly understandable, since in democracies, people can only hold their uh, elected national governments accountable, and not the international institutions. Many in the US, and some in Europe, see these as outdated, 
as an albatross constraining or even harming the pursuit of US interests. Now, mind you, the criticism is not altogether wrong. The architecture certainly needs an overhaul. But from the German perspective, an architecture we need. Because taking back control in the framework of a nation state almost by definition cannot extend to taking back control over globalization. In a way, Germany, both as a member of the European Union and as part of the international community, can serve to illustrate this point. Robert Kagan, in a recent article for Foreign Affairs, wrote that, and now I quote, the Germany of today is a product of the liberal world order, by which he meant that its integration, Germany's integration in European and international architectures had ended the German question of old and was even strong enough to absorb, to absorb the shock as seen by some in Europe, though not in the United States, of German reunification. As for his, Kagan's, conclusion, to wit that, and now I quote, it is time to think about what might happen, he meant with regard to Germany, or with Germany, when this order unravels. I would prefer to treat it as an experiment in thought. There's virtually nobody in Germany who would find any merit in such a perspective. But it e is easy to see that many, if not all, of our neighbors in Europe would be profoundly troubled by it. Already now, the erosion of the international order affects my country strongly, politically and perhaps psychologically, in ways different from what Americans would imagine. We are one of the most globalized countries in the world, not only as a trading nation. We equate this with security, welfare, and progress because that's what our experience in the past 70 years has been. The United States is a continent and the single most powerful country in the world. It can, if it chooses to, be more inward looking and self-contained. A country like Germany cannot. We depend on a multilateral framework based on rules and compacts and institutions. It's our lifeline. We wouldn't, couldn't, be where we are today without it. We have, I know, immensely profited economically, politically, and security-wise from this world order's flaws and all included. Today, the US administration pursues what I would call a policy of selective withdrawal from institutions of global governance. I don't dispute the reasons for criticizing many of these institutions. But withdrawals and or disparagements of these institutions can produce costs. They can frustrate attempts at reform. They can empower, empower adversaries who never liked the constraining effect of American-led global governance. They can undermine the moral high ground of democracy, and they can give license to autocrats. We would give up institutions and norms that have survived challenges from powers who did not and still do not have much sympathy for these rules and yet had to accept them because of your power. After all, the international system as we know it has been shaped by American power at its historical apex. It would be delusionary to think that one could rebuild a better one from scratch at a time where the relative weight of the United States and the West has declined. To illustrate my point, I for one still hope that we will not see a hard Brexit, but the discussion of it about it, in my view, already shows quite clearly how gigantic the challenges of a fresh start can be, even though only in one area of Great Britain's multilateral envir environment. 
This is why there are concerns in Berlin and Brussels and Paris and other European capitals that Europeans and Americans may be increasingly looking at the world through different lenses. The perception has been fed by rhetoric critical of the multilateral system and also of the EU. But not just the EU. At times it seemed that it targeted NATO as well. Maybe we in Europe are too much wedded to the institutional status quo. Maybe this is the case because we do not think we can change it on our own. And maybe we underestimate the chances inherent in having a strong partner for strong reforms as the US can be. But of course the question is whether the US wants reforms or complete reset. As regards the European Union, I hear a lot of criticism in the US. It is a fact that the European Union is probably the most important international body or organization to which the US does not belong. Moreover, the EU is a trade and economic and rule setting heavyweight with the potential to interfere with major interest, US interests in exports or taxation and other issues. The EU is complicated and slow in foreign policy and other fields due to its consensus principle, but even where issues just require majority votes, um, they take time too. And to make things even more complex, the EU was not designed as a foreign, uh, foreign uh, policy and security actor. Henry Kissinger must still be asking for the tele one telephone number of the EU. At the very least, he can get three. <laughs> one for the president of the council, one for the president of the commission, and one for the president of the parliament. Hence, it is the traditional reflex for Washington to deal with Europe on foreign, foreign and security policy either via NATO or through bilateral challenge, channels. This is not new and it takes two to tango after all. But the EU is not a bloc which is pitted, uh, pitted against US interests. It is composed of now still 28 members and all of them would claim they are aligned with US interests and values. But its force comes from agreement as ploddingly as this is oftentimes arrived at. Now divide and rule or bilateralization strategies may gain support of individual members, but tends to weak an organization that in many respects has the potential to be a strategic asset for US power, values and interests. Thus, I would make the case for, first, preserving and adapting the international order and its institutions, instead of reducing incentives to reform by disparaging them. Second, upholding principles and norms, and not only for moral reasons, but also because we need to be able to stand our ground, ground and defend our way of life. Reta third, re retaining, or still better, enhancing transatlantic unity, because the lack of it will be carefully noted by our adversaries and will tell them how far they can go. NATO has been the most successful alliance in history. We cannot squander this heritage, certainly not in a more hostile geopolitical environment. And in this context, let me assure you, that the message you give to us on burden sharing has been taken in. Fourth, bilaterally and in the EU-US EU context, expand consultation and cooperation on international challenges. There's so many, from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and many more. And fifth, of all the big global pay players, the EU is the one that is closest to you and your values, our values. The EU may not be in the best of, shape, of shapes right now. Criticism is often justified. It's justified and it's welcome. But challenging the strategic relevance and desirability of European integration is not 
because this goes against the core of national interests of member states. Their capacity to stand the ground in a world confronting them with threatening challenges where individually they would be weak or lost. And I would argue that you would be cutting one of the branches that you are sitting on. Thank you. Ambassador Haber, thanks so much for the, those uh, prescient remarks. They, they make us all think uh, about the importance of the international order that has been created and has been part of, uh, of our daily lives for at least our, my daily life from, from the beginning, but for the last 70 years. And it is precarious for a whole bunch of reasons that you pointed out. When the discussion happens, as, as we just heard, there is a lot of blame or a lot of weight being put on the United States as the originator, of the creator of that order, the maintainer of that order. But 70 years hence, how much should Europe, Germany, perhaps our allies in Asia, take up the responsibility for maintaining that multilateral order? To what extent should we start thinking about a rebalancing of responsibilities? where it is not just the United States that provides, but others are stepping up. I hope I was clear enough that I don't place blame anywhere, because I don't. Um, the inter if people speak nowadays about the international order, they seem to speak about something that is rock solid and stable uh, and was never changed. Uh, perhaps needed polishing uh, every now and then, but that was all. Of course, that's nonsense. The international order was not something fixed and unchangeable. It evolved uh, all the time. It changed all the time. And it needs an overhaul. And of course, uh, 70 years after the sort of slow emergen of what, emergence of what we call the international order now, uh, um, conditions have changed. At the outset, the European continent was devastated. Uh, um, destroyed uh, and needed, uh, uh, needed the prospect to economically and socially uh, uh, reconfigure, if you like. Uh, nowadays, in Europe, uh, you see one of the most prosperous uh, regions uh, of the world. Of course, the balance uh, has altered. Second, uh, the geopolitical landscape has altered as well. I would argue that nowadays, uh, the key challengers, strategic competitors, uh, um, are in regions far away from Europe. So my argument would be, uh, yes, of course, Europe has to do more. Yes, of course, Europe has to shoulder more responsibility. But very frankly, not because you tell us to. I understand why you do. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why you do, but we should be doing it because your focus will have to be on other regions in the world. And in that case, uh, European countries will have to fill a void in Europe uh, in order to well, defend in Europe and with you uh, um, our way of life, uh, uh, our interests, our values. So my answer to you is uh, what's happening is, um, uh, is part of a longer continuity. Um, we are faced uh, with new and very uh, 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 profound strategic challenges. Uh, the um, the focus and the the focus will move to other regions in the world, and Europe will have to play a bigger role, which it can, because 70 years have passed by. So, so let's talk a little bit about Europe uh, and sort of the challenges that increasingly Europe needs to uh, face. Not by itself. Hopefully, the United States will continue to be there, but the relative burden is going to shift. One of which Germany and you, uh, in your own uh, past capacity, know uh, as well as, as anyone uh, the challenge of migration. Mm. Uh, the reality not only of folks coming from Afghanistan and Syria, but the reality of a, a, an African continent where increasingly, unless there is economic opportunity in Africa, 
uh, people are going to move north because uh, it's the easiest and the closest uh, place to go. How is Europe going to deal with the issue of migration? Not only the immediate challenge, which I think you uh, and, 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 and your chancellor and your country dealt with uh, uh, in, in 2015 and 2016, but in the long term, the reality that uh, people will be moving, and uh, more people are on the move today than on any point since uh, World War II, and that's unlikely to change. What's the migration challenge, and how is it uh, best going to be handled by Germany and Europe together? When I arrived in the United States, I was amazed uh, to realize um, that there's the widespread notion that migration happened in Europe uh, because Germany had asked for it. It couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, migration usually happens for three reasons. People want to leave their country. Um, it's possible. And they uh, expect better life conditions uh, in other countries. So if you want to deal with migration, you have to deal with these three reasons. Root causes. They can. Um, uh, uh, they can emigrate because it's possible, uh, and the prospects uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the countries of destination. Now, that takes a lot of time. And the, one of the problems is that dealing with the root causes will take much, much more time uh, than dealing with actually sort of um, making migration less possible. We've seen in 2015 and 2016 um, many people coming to Europe uh, that were actually not entitled uh, to asylum or protection. Uh, they came just because the prospects were better. Now, that's a very good reason. I do accept that. Uh, but it's not necessarily a reason for protection. So you'll have to deal with it. And in 2015 and 16, um, it wasn't that the internal borders uh, didn't work anymore. They hadn't worked for a long time because we have the Schengen area. We have a Europe without borders. What didn't work anymore was the external border control. Now, that's a problem also in terms of security, and we had to deal with it, actually, and we paid a price for that. So you'll have to deal with external border control. You'll have to deal with root causes, uh, which takes a much longer time. And you'll have to deal uh, with, um, um, shall we say, with conditions uh, that um, it's, migration always uh, also reacts to markets, you see. And if, mar if, if it's markets uh, or um, uh, the market of uh, traffickers uh, that define migration, we have a problem. So all of that is huge. Uh, it's multidimensional. It takes a lot of time. And it will need European uh, uh, consensus. So speaking about European consensus. Uh, the importance of the union as an, as an actor is already being challenged, as you mentioned, by Brexit. Uh, we have elections in Europe in five, six weeks. Uh, there is the expectation that populists and nationalists are going to win a larger share, if not in the German electorate, certainly in other uh, European countries' electorate, and will be a much more uh, a stronger voice in, in the European Parliament. How should Europe? Germany, first of all, as a leader in Europe, but Europe as such, deal with the rising sentiment of populism and nationalism, some of which has to do with migration, but a lot of it uh, actually has other uh, economic and other origins. Uh, it, um, there are different reasons for the emergence of populism in, uh, in uh, uh, Europe. Actually, there are even different reasons uh, for the emergence of populism in Germany. In some European countries, it is what you indicated, uh, income gaps. In some European countries, it's, uh, um, it was the uh, euro crisis. Uh, and now, um, indeed, uh, migration uh, is looming large. Migration was always linked uh, in history uh, to societies and the identity of society. So that goes to the core of things. And my experience uh, in Germany during those years was that a large number of people came, um, and there was a disconnect between what actually happened and what people felt about it and what they expected their governments to do. And I already mentioned uh, we don't have border controls in Europe anymore. We don't have 
we have borders, of course, but no border controls because the, um, we have open, uh, open borders. Um, and then they felt, we, we, that was the reason for the emergence of populism in Germany. They felt, I didn't elect the government because of that. <laughs> um, I want them to handle the issue. And the truth is, in our, I try to um, indicate that uh, in my remarks. Uh, the truth is that in our globalized world, uh, in Europe, uh, the world of European law and European institutions, the space for sovereign decision making has actually become smaller. And that's a problem because people hold their national governments responsible. This, um, I wouldn't call it disconnect, but there is a dilemma of democracies in global, uh, under the conditions of globalization, and that we'll have to handle. It. Now, um, I would expect, uh, I cannot predict the elections, of course. Uh, I've seen polls uh, according to which uh, um, about 70 percent of the deputies uh, are expected to be re-elected, deputies I know, but they're, they're unknown. That's true as well. Mm, it will be a different European Parliament. But you see, I also believe that the sentiments uh, and the um, the high feelings, if you like. Can one say that? No, one probably can't. Uh, but you know what I mean. Um, that uh, they will take um, more of a backstage uh, once that the numbers of migration have actually uh, dropped. And they have dropped considerably. Um, you don't see that uh, in the debate as yet, but I'm, I'm certain you will. And that will make, uh, will make it easier for us to deal with migration uh, in, in a coherent uh, sense uh, that would include uh, all, or if not as many Europeans as possible. Move to a third sort of big challenge, China. Um, the European Union issued a paper, a new strategy on China, calling uh, China a uh, systemic rival, uh, which was a big, a big statement. Your own government has taken Chinese investments uh, as a challenge in, at times uh, to uh, the security of the, uh, of the country. But there are big differences within Europe uh, about China. In this country, uh, we have moved in a bipartisan way uh, to look at China as an increasing rival uh, of the United States in economics and technology and security sphere. Uh, uh, we have a new national security strategy that talks about competition as the driving force of international politics. Where does Europe's and Germany's view of the confrontation, the, the competition, the rivalry uh, with China lie? How does, how does Europe collectively see China, and how do you in Germany see this, uh, this challenge? We've seen a turnabout uh, in Germany uh, over the past few years. Uh, and that's why we took a lot of decisions uh, with regard to investment screening, uh, uh, for example. Uh, I don't know whether you know about uh, the China paper uh, that our Federation of German Industries uh, uh, has, uh, has published. It clearly defines uh, uh, Chinese activities and Chinese, the Chinese shopping sprees in, uh, um, in the critical uh, infrastructure of our country. So you've seen a big leap forward uh, in realizing uh, uh, that uh, Chinese policies are not only about investment, but are in fact, uh, or uh, political uh, uh, or uh, economic advantages, there are in fact investments, political, financial investments uh, into advantages uh, that can be instrumentalized for political uh, purposes. And this is clearly seen in Germany. It's true um, that on China, uh, European countries um, uh, have been divided, uh, and that China has capitalized uh, um, uh, on uh, drawing a number of European, 16 European countries uh, into uh, debates uh, that would uh, sort of uh, open uh, an off-ramp uh, for China in order to influence our, uh, the general uh, European uh, uh, way of thinking or, or decision-making. I don't think it's much of a success. And I think overall the realization uh, 
that this is not something uh, that is devoid of political strategic objectives, uh, long-term objectives, uh, is growing. Before I open up for the, the floor and also our uh, questions that are being submitted online, one more question I have to ask. I have to ask the burden sharing question. You mentioned it in your speech. You understand that there is a need for uh, Germany to do more. Um, uh, I spent four years banging my head against the table, not only against Germany not doing enough on defense, but many others. Mm. Uh, and I think the biggest disappointment I'll, for, for me and I think many of us who believe strongly in NATO is not that Germany has not moved quickly enough to get to the 2% level, which is to some extent arbitrary anyway, um, but that the movement forward now in the last budget debate took a step back. There was this commitment, and so I want to give you the opportunity. Yeah. A commitment to go to 1.5% of GDP, and it's now being questioned at least once again. Of course, you have a different, you have a difficult uh, grand coalition, you have big political debates about it, um, but a Germany that is as capable and as strong and economically powerful as your country is uh, should probably be able to do more for defense than it has. My country, as all other um, NATO member states, uh, have committed themselves in Wales in 2014 uh, to move towards the 2% um, goal by 2024. Um, this commitment stands. The Chancellor and the Foreign Minister have reiterated uh, that 2% uh, remains uh, uh, the goal they will uh, move uh, forward to. Now, between 2014 and 2018, our defense budget has already uh, uh, increased by 40%. It will have increased by 80% by 2024 once we reach uh, the 1%, uh, 1, <laughs> sorry, 1.5%. Uh, uh, now, you say we've taken a step back. Uh, um, I um, uh, beg to differ. You must always make a difference between the actual budget and the planning par parameters, which are pure fiction, mm -hmm. uh, because they will be subject to domestic uh, um, uh, to domestic wrangling, uh, um, in which many other interests of parties come into. No one, no one uh, uh, refutes. Um, in principle, the, the the move that we have agreed towards one uh, one point five percent, but for the for the year two thousand twenty, we are on course. For the year two thousand twenty one, we just set uh, up uh, we we just announced parameters. Now, if you look at the parameters for past years you will always see that they're far below the actual budget projections. And that's because parameters, to some extent, are the fiction of finance ministers uh, who will start uh, uh, the negotiations about the actual numbers when they need to start the negotiations about the actual numbers. Um, as I said, 1.5% uh, um, by 2024 a growth of 80% uh, in the uh, 10 years between 14 and 24, that's not nothing. And in all fairness, uh, you do know uh, that some turnabout, uh, turnabouts, especially uh, in areas uh, of uh, military planning, they don't happen overnight. Um, these, we're talking really big, big numbers, and we're talking big, big decisions, and they take time. I believe that the United States uh, went, to a sim uh, went through a similar uh, experience uh, after the uh, Vietnam War, when the turnabout uh, also required time. So while I do see your point uh, that uh, you tell us that we need to do more and we need to stick to our commitments, I would also, among allies, uh, ask you for understanding uh, that we want to do the right thing, but some things can't happen as quickly as all of us would like to. I appreciate that. Uh, the commitment is important and ex execution will come as well, so that's great. Let, let's open the floor uh, to uh, questions. Uh, as I said, I have a number here on, uh, online. You can continue to submit those online. We'll go to the, uh, to the far uh, right over there. And 
Thank you for your remarks earlier. You spoke about the root causes of migration that take a long time. Can you talk about which you think are most actionable today and where we need to get, uh, get organized together? Thank you. Will you collect? Uh, no, or just uh, if, you, if you'll answer, then you don't have to remember them. That's actually, it's not an easy question uh, uh, to answer. It would be an, it would be easy if you if we talk about uh, small areas of origin, but we're talking about huge areas of origin. If you look at uh, migrants that have arrived in Germany and Europe, uh, or Europe and Germany in 2015 and 16, we're talking about Syrians, we're talking about Iranians, we're talking about uh, people from Iraq, we're talking about Moroccans, we're talking about Tunisians. Uh, so these were. Um, the largest numbers. So with regard to every country, it, obviously people leave Afghanistan for different reasons. Uh, they would leave uh, Morocco, uh, where I'd say uh, in the one case, uh, the creation of stable, condi stable conditions of security uh, and of development uh, are key. In the other, uh, in the other instance, uh, I would say that uh, youth employment uh, uh, and um, uh, well, youth employment and jobs, well-paying jobs uh, uh, for young people uh, are key. It's huge. You have to uh, you have to use many lenses and not only one. Turn to a question you you addressed it in in your remarks, uh, but perhaps go a little deeper that uh, people are interested in, which is Germany's attitude towards towards Brexit. And and, and let me add to that. Do you see the October thirty first deadline as uh, as real, as unchangeable, or, or, uh, or how, how do you expect Germany and then the European Union to react to not only if Brexit happens, but uh, how the politics in, in the UK is evolving and what Germany can do about it? Well, looking at the history of the debates during the summit, uh, when the uh, date was uh, uh, determined, I'd say it looked, for me, from afar, uh, pretty settled, but um, it's always difficult to comment on that. The position of my country, uh, um, I find it's a tragedy that the UK is leaving the European Union. I think the U European Union will lose a lot. I believe that my country will lose a lot because, after all, uh, we were much aligned with, uh, uh, with Great Britain as regards um, international free trade, for example. Uh, uh, Britain had a global uh, view of world affairs, uh, and perhaps the European Union will uh, turn a bit more parochial mm. than it was before. So it's, we're, losing, we're losing the UK dimension in the European Union. But um, the decision has been taken uh, by the people in the, uh, um, in the United uh, Kingdom and will simply have to deal with it. I still hope, as I said, uh, that we'll manage it in an organized uh, uh, Brexit uh, because the lack of it um, or a non-organized uh, uh, Brexit uh, uh, will probably exact uh, huge costs on all sides and actually also on the world uh, economy. We uh, open it up again to the floor with the gentleman here in the third, fourth row. Um, it seems that Germany thinks it's morally right to accept those refugee, refugees from Syria and pushes all EU countries to uh, accept these refugees as well. However, do you think Germany uh, also thinks it's morally right to continue doing business with Russia even though it supported Assad, who was the reason why those refugees left Syria in the first place? I don't think Germany has pushed any European country uh, um, to uh, take, mind you, in 2014 and uh, 2015 and 2016, the overwhelming majority of refugees arrived in Germany. And they were not redistributed really uh, distributed, uh, from Germany, and if they were in tiny numbers. I know it because uh, I oversaw it at the time. Now, you ask whether it's more, you, uh, you create a link between what happened in Syria, which certainly was not triggered by any decisions taken by Germany, and as I said before, uh, the refugees didn't come because 
my country invited them. They came because external border control didn't work anymore and because they had good reasons to leave uh, their country. So I would, um, I would contend uh, that the premise of your question uh, is correct. Um, where is the link uh, with Russia? My country has always done business with Russia. It's our geography. Uh, Russia is a neighbor uh, uh, of uh, European countries. Uh, you cannot sort of uh, view them as existing in a separate universe. But I would also ask you not to forget uh, that with regard to sanctions, sanctions uh, um, because of Crimea, sanctions because of chemical weapons, sanctions because of Skripal, my country has been a trailblazer in the European Union. And if you want support and alignment with the European Union on future sanctions, my country will be crucial. Now, you did not mention, but you probably uh, had in mind, uh, um, the gas pipeline. Um, I can, we have always, uh, um, since the 1970s, uh, um, imported gas from Russia. I, I understand much of the criticism uh, that has been voiced uh, at the outset uh, with regard to uh, uh, Nord Stream because it's a fact uh, that Russia in the uh, first decade and in 2011, I believe, uh, used uh, um, its gas exports in order to pressure some European countries. Um, but it can't anymore. Um, if it were still possible, I'd see your argument. But the infrastructure of European gas pipelines has been completely uh, um, overhauled in the years since. You can nowadays pump gas into practically any direction. And if that's the case, uh, energy security is not defined or determined by where the gas, com gas uh, comes from, but is determined whether you can replace a provider should this become necessary. And that's the case. Um, that's the case because you you can uh, um, you can secure uh, the um, you, sec you can secure energy supplies should uh, countries be pressured, uh, and you uh, can make sure uh, that you can provide a uh, replace uh, uh, providers by other providers. Actually, we're trying to. Um, we're, we're heading for more, uh, more diversity, as you know. Uh, we also want more LNG. Uh, we are building one, perhaps two, uh, LNG uh, terminals in Europe, in, not in Europe, in Germany, one uh, with certainty, because we do see the prospects of LNG uh, as, an additional, um, uh, as an additional energy uh, supply uh, that would uh, make us more uh, independent. It's the diversity uh, uh, of options that we need. You mentioned the important role that Germany played in uh, putting on and maintaining and strengthening sanctions on Russia, which it certainly has since 2014. And perhaps the single most important person in that effort was Chancellor Merkel. Yes. So that raises a, a question that, that uh, is, is being asked on online, which is what does a post-Merkel Germany look like? Uh, German, uh, Johnson Merkel has been there for a long time, since 2005. She's been an extraordinary leader uh, for many, many years, but she is stepping down uh, at some point before, uh, or, uh, before the next election. Um, uh, what's the future of Germany look like without Angela Merkel at its home? I, I don't understand. If people ask me the question, I understand why they ask the question, but I don't understand uh, why people seem to think that after 14 or 16 years uh, uh, of one chancellor at the helm of a government, uh, a change of government, I mean, after all, it's a democracy, uh, is indicative uh, of instability or insecurity. <laughs> I'd say the very fact that she's been at the top of the government for so long uh, is, uh, is a testimonial to the stability uh, of political structures and change in my country. All right, <laughs> definitely, definitely dealt with. <laughs> Just had a first class lesson on what diplomacy is all about. Any other, <laughs> any other questions, the gentleman here in the middle? 
Hi, Ambassador. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, my question actually has to come from um, your work with cyber terrorism and cybersecurity. Uh, with Chancellor Merkel stepping down, do you think that a foreign power like Russia or anyone else will try to destabilize the fact that Germany's been like the rock of the European Union? Uh, but can you repeat that? Picture? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> the last um, sentence only. Uh, do you think that they'll try to destabilize the fact that Germany's kind of been like the bedrock of the European Union and the stabilization um, with China influence the next election? Well, the fact is that in 2017, uh, during our uh, last elections, there's not been a major attack uh, on our electoral system or the electoral process. Actually, you cannot attack our electoral processes because we, we have a paper-based uh, process. But you can, uh, you can attack uh, um, decision-making processes, mm -hmm. or you can, uh, uh, you can influence or manipulate uh, uh, thinking. That's what we've seen elsewhere. We've seen that, but not on a large scale. And my assumption at the time had been uh, we didn't see it uh, because of what happened here. Because um, while the expectation may have been there uh, that, well, no, I, I think that, let's start the other way around. Um, I believe that the Russians saw that the reaction to uh, um, their meddling had been so strong that their strategic calculus told them it was better um, not to reiterate that um, in Germany, but to make sure uh, that there was, they wanted distance between you and European countries. And I believe that's why it didn't happen uh, in Germany. But the ensuing answer is, of course, it's possible. Are you, uh, are you have you taken measures in the electoral process in particular to try to find vulnerabilities and try to close them off? The paper we, ballot, of course, is, well, is, we, a, is a key is issue. Key, but key. In, in voter registration rolls, uh, which presumably are still online, uh, are they no. protected? Have, have you, are we, you taking we have, that? Uh, we were never worried about the, uh, the electoral uh, processes. Uh, um, we were aware that uh, we were pretty safe there. What, what was out there uh, in 2015, uh, the German parliament had been uh, attacked and the information uh, of the, the data systems uh, had been siphoned off, never appeared anywhere. But obviously, uh, that was something that was simply out there and we weren't certain whether something would appear. Uh, uh, in the wake of elections, but again, uh, your reaction has been so forceful, so strong, uh, and so uh, unequivocal. I think it sent a strong message uh, um, elsewhere. Uh, particularly, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. A particularly pertinent question, given what happened over the weekend in in San Diego, is a question from uh, 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 online on how should the United States and Europe uh, address the rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, overt anti-Semitism in both our countries. Do you see this as a major challenge? Is this an issue that is becoming more and more part of your discussion with the U.S. government and within, within Europe? It's an issue where we are and should be in full alignment and our language um, and position um, should be as forceful as it possibly can be uh, in favor of solidarity, uh, um, um, solidarity with Jewish communities and in our stance against, uh, against anti-Semitism, as strong as it possibly can be. Just here in the third, uh, third row. Hello, good evening. Ginter Rubin uh, in Arab Invest. Um, I'm going to switch actually a little bit of theme and um, turn into positive of this. Uh, once a very wise person told me uh, a few months ago that um, if you are not aware of other person being negative positive, always think that they're thinking positive. Um, something that they have in mind to do well by law, by agreements that this is going to be always work towards the positive in the world. 
something that um, Ambassador Haba and I talked, and I want to bring to positive but one about together, uh, German Week this week, that no matter what happens, wherever the fire falls, um, that we all are striving for a well to intend to do well by everybody. So my question and the turn of the uh, night is that after all is this getting together to do well by all and do well by others, it, be that immigration, be that economic, be that political. Um, I'm honored and pleased to see that we here together tonight to do well between two countries, US and Germany and EU overall. So thank you for having us and um, Wunderbar together this week. Tell, 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 tell thank you. That's a, that's a, a, we all believe in positiveness. Tell us a little bit about Wunderbar together. That's an initiative uh, that we launched back in October. It had been planned since quite a while. Uh, we had uh, comparable initiatives in a number of countries, Mexico and India and, and so forth. Actually, I was amazed when I arrived here uh, that it took us, it took my country so long uh, to conceive such an initiative uh, for what is, after all, uh, the closest partner we have uh, beyond the Euro European Union. So um, this initiative is trying to tap into the reservoir of, um, um, of where, where we have uh, common thinking, common interests, common values. I keep thinking, um, as uh, Kinja Rubin said, uh, um, we hear so much uh, about the differences uh, that we have, and actually I dwelt about, uh, on it as well. But the truth is uh, that our bilateral relationship is incredibly intense. Uh, it's intense because uh, we have so many commonalities. Uh, we, this, the number of people of German heritage in the United States is huge, 50 million uh, all in all. Think about how many people had, uh, had um, done a tour of service in Germany. 70 million GIs who'd been in Germany uh, with their families. Think of the high number of students. Uh, both my children work in the United States, have studied in the United States. Uh, the number of students at universities, the university exchanges, uh, the city partnerships, that's huge. And we're trying to tap into precisely that. And this is huge because it's not, it's not going to go away uh, because we have, um, because you're unhappy with us on, on burden sharing. Uh, um, <laughs> and you are right to be unhappy. <laughs> um, so that's something uh, to, to celebrate, uh, actually. And that's what we wanted to put uh, a center stage. And, um, get into discussions with as many pop people in the United States as we possibly can on issues uh, that you find important, on issues that we find important. We want to understand where we think alike, where we don't, and why that is the case. Actually, it's about human beings. Well, among friends, which is what we are, uh, it's wonderful to have you here in Chicago. Back to the land of, uh, <laughs> uh, of your uh, your great grandparents, your grandparents, grandparents. Um, uh, who, were, who had a great uh, opportunity to see Chicago. Wunderbar together uh, opened up last uh, week here in, uh, on Daly Plaza uh, uh, to celebrate the strength of the relationship. Uh, the reality is we have been disagreeing on many issues for many, many years, but we always remember that we're friends and allies. So it's wonderful to have you back here Thank you. Uh, in Chicago. Come back soon. I will. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Hopper. <laughs>